Major support for these broadcasts is provided by New York Community Bank, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chelsea Lighting, Capital One Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Genova Burns, Gian Tomasi and Webster, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, The Wickhoff Group, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, m and Bank. Additional support is provided by Ackman Ziff Real Estate Group, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, Bruce Mosler, C.B. Richard Ellis, Colliers International, New York, LLC, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, DDG Partners, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Flushing Bank, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, John Katsimatidis, Red Apple Group, Madison Realty Capital, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Massey Knackle Realty Services, New Banks, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Sterling and Sterling, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, and These Friends. His name is Scott Major. He's the chairman and CEO of Perfect Building Maintenance. But more important, he's a dear friend, and I'm very happy that he's here today. Thank you, Michael. So, Scotty, let's talk about Grandpa David, how he came over, and a little bit about him, because mm -hmm. it's really interesting. Well, Grandpa David was an Austrian immigrant who came over here when he was about 18 years old, slept on a park bench down in lower Manhattan, and uh, met my grandmother on that park bench. And as a matter of fact, there's really? a they met downtown, and on their wedding night, they were on a bench. So David came over when he was 18. And what yes. about, where did your grandmother come from? She came from Poland. She came from Poland. So they meet? When I'm did not they exactly, meet? We're never, we were never quite sure what my grandmother's age was. but uh, So when did they meet? Uh, within days of getting here. And what is your, now he came over alone. There was yes. no other relatives. No other relatives. So, uh, Family stayed back so in he's in Austria. Yeah. Right. So tell me the squeegee story. Well, he had to make a living. So he started with a, like most people in this industry back then, he started with a squeegee in a bucket and going around, and mostly in, in Brooklyn at the time. And this is when, windows. in the 20s? Early 20s, 1923, he started PBM before that. So he's walking around with a bucket and a squeegee, five cents a window? Yeah, it was a nickel a window. Nickel a window, and... What, what happens then? He then he created uh, the, the Argo company. Argo Window Clean. Argo Window. How, how, any idea? Did you ever find out why it was Argo? I once asked him where he got Argo from. He wanted it to be the letter A in the yellow pages, so that when somebody was looking under window cleaning, he would be one of the first ones there. So he creates Argo Window Cleaning. So how does he get from the squeegee to be a cleaner? It started out as a window cleaning company, and it was a window cleaning company. Uh, solely in the beginning and when his my father got into the business and then some of his sons they started to expand the services before we get talk about uh, your late dad norman who i really loved and we had a great relationship let's talk about since grandpa dave came over you were saying many of his relatives uh were perished in the holocaust most of his family stayed back in, in austria and and most of my family's, my, my grandparents' relatives were, were lost in the Holocaust. Now, perhaps this had a major impact because your, your grandfather was very involved with the founding of the State of Israel, involved with State of Israel bonds. Yes. Let's talk a little bit about he that. He was the, the chairman of the Farban Zionist organization and the chairman of State of Israel bonds. I have 
many vivid memories as a child, uh, going to bond meetings and, and, and seeing, meeting people like Golda Meir and, and Moshe Dayan. Right, and, uh, and didn't, wasn't there something with Menachem Begin? I mean, Menachem Begin was, was, was one of his buddies, that was his, one of his boys. And Menachem Begin, if you know his history, he was sort of... Uh, the Haganah. Yeah, 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 sure. One of and basically, Grandpa David was helping to support bringing money over... Bringing money over to Israel to help them uh, to, to get independence. So I guess they would look at it as independence from the British. Uh, he was also very, very involved, their organization, with rescuing Jewish families from Cuba when Castro took over and, and pulling people out. My grandfather was a tough man, very, very so tough let's, man. So then your grandfather had the squeegee business, the Argo window cleaning, they were three brothers, three sons he had. Yes. Okay, and your, your father, Norman. My father's Norman was, was, is the eldest, uh, and, uh, and then there was Marvin and Lonnie, and they also had, they also had a uh, sister, Shari. So let's talk about you, your dad grew up in Brooklyn. Yes. And uh, he, like his uh, son, um, was tall. Yes, yeah, sure uh, was. Uh, as opposed to the host over here, a little shorter than you. <laughs> and... Um, Marvin was a pretty good basketball player, right? Norman. 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 Uh, yeah, a very good basketball player. He, he actually didn't make his high school basketball team originally. We told him to go home and grow. Uh, but he played at Lafayette High School and uh, was, was, was good enough to get himself a basketball scholarship to St. John's University. So he gets a basketball scholarship at St. John's University, and then he's drafted. Well, he's in, in St. John's for two years. Uh, before he's drafted, and uh, very good team. They won the NIT championship. No, no, both no, years. no. Drafted in the army. Yes, yes. After two years, he's drafted into the army. He's drafted in the army. He comes back, and St. John's doesn't want to give him the scholarship. That's correct. They they don't honor the scholarship, and he goes to City College. Goes to City College. Free. And City College uptown. Yes. And what happens at City College? This is a great story because your dad was a very famous college basketball player. Yes, yes, he was. He so had it's a very famous career. Uh, he goes to City College, and uh, for the first year he's at City College, they win the NIT championship again, and then the next year at City College, his senior year, they win the NIT championship again, and there's a lesser-known championship called the NCAA, which is being held in Madison Square Garden that year, so they decide to have the New York City College team, which had just won the larger championship, which was the NIT, be a participant, and they were the last seed, and they end up winning the NCAA championship that year as well. The only team in the history of college basketball to but ever the, win both championships. Let's talk the same about year. before they won the championship. They were playing against this person who basically didn't like New Yorkers, right? Ah, there's a very famous story about uh, Rupp. in Adolf, Adolf Rupp in the uh, NCAA during the NCAA finals. I think they met them in the semifinals. He was the coach of Kentucky. Kentucky, Rupp Arena, Adolph Rupp is very famous. Uh, and uh, when Adolph Rupp came to New York, he was asked by the New York Herald Tribune reporter, how did he think uh, they would do against the Cinderella team right. from New so York? This Kentucky team, you know. Was which, was the, which was the championship team the year before. Uh, and Adolph Rupp uh, made a statement that if my Kentucky homegrown boys can't put, beat a bunch of Jews and blacks from New York, I'll send them home with a tin cup. And that became the headline. That was the headline in the, the, in the newspaper. And how bad was the Kentucky team de defeated? To this day, it is the single largest margin of defeat in Kentucky history. It was about 35 points. They blew him off the court. So this was for the semis? That was for the semis. And then they went on to meet Bradley in the finals, and they beat Bradley for the NCAA championship. So my father won five national championships with two different teams in two different decades. The only person to ever do that. So he graduates CCMY now. Mm -hmm. He's a, you know, a great team. Mm -hmm. New York City was very proud oh, of the NIT, NCAA, NCAA yeah. and all the tournaments. And your dad gets drafted by the Baltimore Bullets. That's correct. Uh, the Baltimore Bullets in the NBA and the Waterloo Hawks was another team in another league. I think it was the ABA league that had drafted him, and he went to play for the Bullets. Now, how long did he play for the Just one season. Right. And, and at that time, uh, Grandpa David says, It's a game, know, a bunch of men running around in shorts, get, get serious, and come get to work. How did your dad meet your mother? Met my mother at the park. 
wait a second, you, your grandfather meets your grandmother on the park bench, yeah. and your father meets... I think it was a handball court, actually, he met my mother on, but they met in a park, yeah. And, so, uh, and she looked at his driver's license, and she pronounced his name correctly, so he said, I'll marry you. So when did your parents get married? If, Ooh, my mom was 17, and my dad was, you know, a bit older, about 24. So he had finished, he was now in the, in the business. Yeah, so, yes. so now... Uh, th did Dad carry a squeegee? I mean, what, what, what? I think he actually started holding the ropes for the window cleaners. But he wasn't anybody that you know actually did. So the he was the first brother who went into the business. That's correct. That's correct. He had, my dad had you know he had been a professional player. He was a little bit older. He's obviously very streetwise. He'd been through the army. Uh, big personality. You knew my father. He's a big personality. So he was. It's more the outside person in terms of sales and and and. You know. And that was really. So when did they change the name? from Argo to Perfect Building. Oh, before then, it was like 1920. Perfect Building started in 1923. Now, you were saying to me that something that you know continued, and we'll get to your life in a second, was that the relationships that Grandpa started and then really were rebuilt by your father and your father built are many clients that you continue to do business with today, like the Braun family. Yes, there are clients today that we've had for 30, 35, 40 years. I think some of them do business with us for no other reason than they love my father and love my grandfather. And uh, it's, it, it's, it's lasted forever. So now let's talk about you, okay? Your mom and dad, where were they living when you were born? Uh, they were living in Brooklyn, but soon after I was born, they moved to Long Island, Franklin Square. And uh, where did you go to uh, public school? I went to Cary High School in Franklin Square, and then I went to Fairleigh Dickinson University. Before we get to Fairleigh Dickinson, so did, did that bring you to the office? I mean, oh yeah, oh yeah. We came into the office. Uh, if it was uh, you know spring break and I wanted some money to go you know spend the spring break, I, he would have me come in and with, with my friends and we could you know clean some bathrooms. Uh, when I got a little bit older, if there was a snowstorm, I would load up a bunch of friends and we'd come into the city and shovel snow in front of the buildings, you know, wherever we had to do. Did you have a union card? No, we did not have a union card. And we weren't very good at it either, you know, quite frankly. we throw a lot of salt so we didn't have to do too much shoveling, so that was... So it, let's talk about high school. Mm -hmm. uh, you're in high school. Uh, you graduated, what, Cary High School? Cary High School. Cary High School. Did you play uh, basketball? I did, I did. I how, did. how were you? I was okay. I, was, I, was I mean, okay. I mean, I was, uh, I, I was a, a center in high school, and I it got me into college, and it paid for a piece. Now, so, how did you decide to go to Fairleigh Dickinson University? Uh, it, it was cl not too far from home, and they had a good basketball team, and and I, I so liked the coach. Let's talk about the your 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 three year career in basketball, right? Yes. Yes. How'd you do? What what happened? You know, uh, I was okay. sometimes you know you see I never played. You know, I could be a point guard, but you know I, I didn't play. So what happened? You uh, were playing a little ball and somebody went into you. No, no, it wasn't. Uh, that would that would be a nice story if we wanted to change it. But uh, I broke my hand on someone's face, and uh, that sort of ended my 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 basketball career. Yes. Yeah, so you, I think it's a good story. Tell me what happened. It was, it, it was not that good okay, a story. So, so <laughs> you broke your hand, and this was your third year of uh, yes, your yeah. third year. Mm -hmm. You continue fairly, and you, one thing that you knew, you didn't want to go into the family business. I fought my whole life to stay out of the family business. Uh, so what happens is you graduate fairly Dickinson. You get accepted to a, a number of law schools, right? Yes. And you were your kid from New York City. Pepperdine? I mean, Malibu. Uh, I, I realize, but I, wait a second. Israel, from New York is, Israel and Pepperdine don't really have anything to... to what you, what I, Jewish I think kid that, from New York doesn't want to move to California and live in Malibu and go to law school? So that, tell me about... I mean, the, I had choices. I could have so gone to New Orleans. I could have gone to Chicago. Uh, Pepperdine. Uh, great school. Great school. Great law school in Malibu. Uh, uh, while I was there, we put an intramural team into the undergraduate campus's basketball program. So you played a little b-ball? Yeah. Uh, Pepperdine was great. Pepperdine was great. I, I'm, to this day, I'm on the uh, board of visitors of the law school for about the last 18 years or so. It's, uh, Pepperdine was, was, was wonderful. But I wanted to work back in New York when I got So there. you graduate uh, you graduate Pepperdine. How old were you? You were very young at this time, I think. 21. 21? Yeah. When you graduated law school? Uh, 20, no, 24. 20, 23, 24. 23, you graduated law school. 
and you come back to New York and you get a job. No, no, I go to NYU for oh, you go, wait, I know, you go, go to NYU, NYU for your master's. And yes, an LLM, LLM at New York University's Law School. Which is a tough situation. And you're, at, you're getting your LLM and then you, there's this law firm that your first job was with the great law firm of Bill Shea, Shea and Gould. Yeah, Shea and Gould, very powerful, uh, very politically powerful, powerful firm. politically powerful firm. Yeah. Shea Stadium. Shea Stadium, a, a variety of situations. Uh -huh. Now, when you went over there, what, what department were you in originally? Because you, were, you had a master's in tax. So, I mean, come on. It was actually very interesting. When I was interviewing there, uh, after I went through a series of interviews, they made me an offer. I remember the attorney's name was Ernie Bertolotti, uh, and he had made me an offer to work in their real estate department. And I said to him, I don't know anything about real estate. And he leaned in and he said, really, what do you know? I go, well, I have an LLM in tax and corporate law. And he, he said, listen, kid, it doesn't matter what department I put you in here. You're going to be running around for a good year, year and a half. You're not going to know which side is up. So I said, well, you know, probably true. And he, he said, uh, you just got an offer, you know. I said, well, let me think about it and I'll let you know. He goes, no, I want an answer right now. I said, I'll take it. So you took the job over there and you spent about a year there, yes. right? Yeah. And then, you know, there's this other firm which has another very prominent, mm -hmm. it's called Proskauer. Okay? Proskauer, Rose, Proskauer. Mend Mendelssohn, and, yes. And, you know, Proskauer is a very famous law firm. And over here, you know, you really learn a little bit about the real estate business. Let's mm -hmm. talk about the, the years at Proskauer. Uh, well, Shane Gould first, it was mostly shopping center developing that we were rep represented uh, to Toys R Us. And they were building a lot of shopping centers at the time. And then when I moved over to Proskauer, it was a much more, uh, a lot of real estate syndicators that they had represented, but also I became sort of by default uh, Marty Raines' attorney, MJ Raines, which was a big co op converter at the time. And uh, Marty Raines was involved in a very famous transaction. Let's talk about that transaction. Uh, the John T. and Catherine MacArthur Foundation properties were purchased by a partnership of Marty Raines, Bernie Mendick, and the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the they United States. They bought a States. couple of apartments, right? A couple of apartments. They bought, it was about 4,000 units that they bought all at once, which including Lincoln Towers which on the was, west side. Which was the biggest conversion ever, I think, in America yes. of the apartments. Because this was originally, Lincoln Towers was, the equi was owned by Alcoa mm -hmm. going back. Yes. So it was Alcoa, uh, the aluminum company, who built these apartments on the west side, which is probably during the period of the development of Lincoln Center. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, you know, at that time, Lincoln Center... Wild, it, Wild West. It was, yeah. was Wild, yeah. Wild West, you know. It was the true West Side story, mm -hmm. as, true. you know, uh, they brought out in the 50s. And it was a neighborhood in transition. You know, today you look at the West Side, and it's, it's a to totally yeah. different world. And that was one of the properties, but there were other properties up there. And uh, and so Eastgate... Uh, it was, it was uh, several apartments, uh, buildings on the east side and the west side. It was 4,000 apartments that we had to convert all at once. And I remember back then the interest carry was something like $70,000 a day. So when you're the attorney working on the conversion and you need to get offering plans in front of printers and out in front of the AG's office and get them out, every day mattered. Every, so. Now, what other, other major transactions were you involved with at that time? Uh, they, Mr. Raines had also purchased at that time the Bing and Bing properties. And that was another nice... Now, the Bing and Bing properties were in a lot of them in the West Village. Yes, some in the West Village and a lot on the Upper East Side. But also at the time, they were very, very sexy con properties to be converted from apartments to, uh, to, to, to co-ops and a couple of condos, but mostly co-ops. So I became this expert in co-op conversions right before the tax laws changed. And then what happened? It kind of dried up that conversion market somewhat and, uh, and interest rates started taking off. But we were converting apartments to co-ops when interest rates were 23%. And so now I got this guy who has, I, you know, He's a lawyer, he has his LOM, he's a specialist in shopping centers and in co-op conversions. And when do you leave Proskauer? I left Proskauer to go work for a real estate syndicator called H.L. Michaels. I think that's about the time you and I that's first met. met. Yes. And that's in the late 
80s. Uh, just before, late, late 89. 89, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, when the world was over because the tax shelter world had changed. Tax, tax, tax was changed in 86. Right, but it was 89, and I remember meeting you. You were working for this person who is auctioning properties, right? He's auctioning properties now. At the time, we were uh, still raising money in syndications, and we were converting buildings in Bay Ridge and in New Jersey. Uh, but the, the concept was to buy these apartment buildings or garden apartment complexes and convert them to co-ops, which was a little challenging. When we were doing it in South Jersey and in Philadelphia, we'd put up a sign saying co-ops for sale, and people would come in and go, what's a coop? So, so it was going to be a tough sale. And we had to explain to not only the customers that came in what a co-op was, but at that time we'd also have to explain to the attorneys when they brought these offering memorandums to them what they were buying and what, what a co-op was as well. So how long did you spend with Howard? I'd say about three years. And so, so this is, I think it's like 1992? Yes. It's 1992. Um, you know, you really, you're practicing law, you're working with Howard, you're not really certain of what you want. Mm -hmm. But, you know, PBM had this nice little building on, uh, it was East 31st Street. No, no, West. West, West 30, 31st Street. Seven West Fifth 30. Avenue changed. It was yeah. a small little building. I still remember it well because, you know, we'd walk into the office, your dad, there were these big pictures that Grandpa David had. There were the basketball pictures over there. Mm -hmm. There was like the memorabilia. It was Steiner memorabilia. <laughs> and, and then on the second floor, okay, because it was a very small, narrow building. I think originally the building was a five-story building and there had been a fire, so they just lopped off the top three floors and left it a two-story building. And I remember going up that small staircase, and then on the second floor was... The staircase you know, was the, tilted. Right, the, the tilted staircase, little staircase, and there was, this, there was this lawyer sitting up here, okay, you know, and Dad and the uncles are running a cleaning company. Yes. And you're there... Basically, I just took space upstairs to, I was doing some real estate auctions and some brokerage and I was doing some real estate closings and trying to do some different deals and basically deals from my own account and then working with some of my friends and customers that I had worked with previously. And where I could, using my real estate context to help refer people over to my dad and my uncles and PBM. So then what, 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 what is the situation that one day you say, I'm getting involved. Now, your dad was running the company, and he got sick. If yeah, my dad got sick. My dad was diagnosed with leukemia, and, and he progressively got sick. And, and, uh, and during that time, I spent a lot of time with him in the office. It was great because, as you know, I don't think there was a father and son closer than my dad and I. You know, And just to get to work with him and work together and see how he was doing things. He was a better he golfer been. than you. Uh, yeah, yeah, he was definitely he was a better athlete than I was, you know. He, when he played basketball, he was a star. When I played basketball, uh, you know, a white guy that jumped and came down in the same place wasn't going too far, so it was, it was a little difficult. Much better athlete So than when I do was. you get involved full-time in PBM? I bought the company. Uh, 12, this past August was 12 years ago. Now, in addition to the, the, the cleaning business, something w which we'll talk a little bit about over there, something that you got involved with, was this entity called Short Path? Yes. It's the world. Let's talk about Short Path and well, how you got involved because that was one of the the differences of PBA. Sure. And also, you. Sure. Uh, while I'm sitting upstairs and before I'm involved, uh, I looking at doing some things with PBM and considering it, and I got involved with another gentleman, Jeffrey Friedman, and we came up with this concept, this idea for Short Path, which was basically a web-based building operating system. Uh, communications device for buildings, very, very ahead of the time, but it was also, you know, just in the middle of that dot-com boom, at the, you know, that was going on. And uh, we developed this software that was pr pretty much very cutting edge. And uh, when I later took over PBM, it really became one of the things, what we used to call one of our purple cows, the differentiator between us and other companies, that we basically took this mop and bucket company and added this technology to it. And when people used to ask us what was the difference between PBM and any of our competitors, I would say, okay, don't laugh, but it's our technology. Because I knew at the end of the day it was about cleaning a toilet. But, you know, we, we had this technology that really set us apart from our competitors. Now, you, you also did another thing, which you've really always been involved with, you know, with the, the green, the environmental. Let's yeah. talk about that. Well, I think if you start with Shorepath, we always have strived to 
be ahead of the curve, be different. I think we were the very first people to do use green products and green cleaning and doing a lot of research of green products. And in the very beginning, uh, the green products weren't as good. So since the cleaning business is very uh, based on labor and labor costs, if we switch products to a green product, but it didn't work as well and they had to do a lot more scrubbing and rubbing, it, w it wasn't as good. That has changed now over the years. The green products have become much, much better, and we now tell, you know, green can save you green. But that used to be, it was, it was short path, and we would talk about green. Uh, we led the industry at the time when avian flu was, was of a concern, and we created seminars for our customers. All those different types of things that we really tried to do to, to be a trusted advisor to our building owners and managers. Now, how do you grow from 7 West 31st Street to, like, six offices? Well, well, the business grew a lot. Like, when I took over the company uh, in, in 12 years ago, it, we were doing about $22 million a year in business. Now we're doing well over $100 million a year in business. And some of it's just the cost of our services have gone up, but we've also grown with some of our key customers. And we've had some very, very loyal customers that were on this acquisition train, and we've been able to grow along with them. and. and pick up some very big properties, some very sexy properties. But let's talk about f family, you know, your, your, your wife and your, your two wonderful children. I, I, have the, I still remember being at the Briss <laughs> with the... With the, with, the, mo the with late the moil. Mo with the moil going <laughs> to the wrong place, which was sure. a great story, you know. Right. And as your dad said to me, that's my son. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, but it, it was a great story. We sure. Everybody could have eaten three hours later. <laughs> but so you got, you're got you married how many years now? Ten years. You're married ten years. Just my tenth anniversary. And, and you have two adorable. I have a nine-year-old son named David, named after my grandfather, David Major. And I have a six-and-a-half-year-old girl, Nora, who's named after my Father, no. father, right. yeah. and and you've been involved. You've been giving back quite a bit. You know, Stephen Gaynor School and some other things. Let's talk about some of the charitable involvement. Well, I think if you go back to my grandfather and his involvement with the state of Israel and, and different charities, we've always been pressed as a family to get involved in in one charitable cause or another, and s sort of left up to us what to do. And uh, I met you very early on through ver uh, several of your philanthropic organizations. And I think we were very involved with Einstein Medical Center very early on. Right. Yeah. And uh, my approach has really been the things that I enjoy getting involved with have to do, well, certainly with Israel, but uh, things in the medical community where I think there's a need and also schools and education. Th th that's, that's where... My it's interest lies. Stephen Gaynor is a very important. Stephen Gaynor is very important to me and to my family. Uh, reason being, my son is at the Stephen Gaynor School. Uh, when he was about f five years old, uh, we f we thought that to be the best location for him, and I've gotten very involved there. I think the work that they do is is, is terrific, and uh, and really try to uh, stay involved there. I'm now on the board of trustees at the Stephen Gaynor School. And another thing which has been very important in your life is the, uh, let us say, the, maybe it comes from the Israel, maybe it comes from the pride of being a Jew, is your involvement with the, the learning of the Torah and learning of... Uh, well, that, that actually started for a different reason. When, when, when my father passed away in 2005, I, I, I sort of wanted to do something. It, it was a very difficult time for me personally because we were extremely, extremely close. And I wanted to do something that I thought would honor him and honor his soul and honor his memory. And uh, I came up with the idea to, uh, I, I, like most people, s stopped going to Hebrew school sometime after I was you know, about 13. 13 years old, you know, once you didn't have to. And I decided to get back into it and st start learning again. And I have managed uh, through a, a wonderful rabbi uh, named J. Margolis from Or Sameach. To, uh, I, I learn with the rabbi now. Uh, every week since my father passed away, since 2005, I've kept it up for seven years. As a matter of fact, I was with him today. That's great. So I'd say, you know, for somebody who I know over nearly 25 years, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I know the family, you know, you, the PBM story, the kids, you know, and, and everything, it's, it's a wonderful New York story, and, and it shows you that sometimes you don't expect to get into be a third generation, but sometimes it happens, yeah, and yeah. it's been good. And mm -hmm. perhaps maybe, you know, uh, maybe David and Nora might be there, but only, only time will tell. That would require me to keep doing this for a very long time. Okay, but more important, only the best of luck.
Thank you. Happy Michael. for being here today. Thank you for having me.